Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, go on to the next talk. This is uh, going to be uh, given by Duncan Pritchard from the University of California at Irvine. Um, just as I said something uh, slightly embarrassing about myself in connection to the other speakers, I'm going to do the same thing in connection to Duncan. Um, I see uh, Stephen here as well. Duncan, Stephen, David, Daniel, all of them have uh, written papers that have been absolutely incredible and influential for me. So when I was uh, first doing my PhD on understanding, um, I read a couple of their papers and I was a mind blown. Right, this is just amazing. Right, so uh, thanks again, you guys. Uh, and without further ado, and with much gratitude, next up we have Duncan Pritchard, the nature and value of understanding. Duncan, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Andre, and uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to speak. I'm sorry, I, I'm not there for much of this. The time difference is kind of crazy, and uh, it's uh, it's sort of a bad bad week as well. You know, Thanksgiving, all that kind of stuff. But uh, but I'm delighted to be here for this talk. So what I'm going to do is um, let me just move my yeah, that's better. Um, I want to revisit um, some of my earlier work on on understanding um, uh, and sort of go over it and sort of make it, like make the case for it again. Um, this was part of I mean going, I'm going back even now to the, my 2010 book on the nature of value of knowledge, which I co-authored, but my my section of that book. Um, so. That was primarily about knowledge, and I have this this view about knowledge. But the the idea was always that this uh, we we understand what understanding is by uh, with reference to being clear how it fits within a, a certain a relationship to a certain theory of knowledge. So what I want to do is bring out the understanding side, bring that to the fore, and um, and focus on that. So I'm going to be talking about understanding and knowledge. I want to talk about uh, epistemic luck, as we'll see. That's very important here. Um, I want to talk about achievements. And uh, cognitive achievements is a subclass of that, which again, I think that's very important here to understanding what's going on. And then I'll conclude by talking about the, the value uh, of understanding. Just a preliminary, um, I'm gonna focus on uh, a particular kind of understanding, which I think is core, roughly understanding why such and such, whether that such and such is something relatively specific, like you know, why did the event occur? Why is something the way that it is? Something like that. Often this is called propositional understanding. Um, and I'll, I'll follow convention on that and, and use that same terminology. I'm not sure it's the best one to use, but, um, but, it, but at least it gives you a nice contrast to another kind of understanding, which we might call holistic understanding, uh, which I think is a good terminology. That's what you get when you understand uh, you know, a subject matter, let's say. I think something similar is happening when we talk about understanding a person. You know, to understand quantum physics is not to understand why something specific, it's a, it's a body. And it has certain different properties. But I, I think this, the notion of understanding I'm going to focus on, it's, it's core, I think it's quite common. I think it's also core, not just in the sense of being common, but also in the sense that, although I'm not going to argue for this, I think you can, we can explicate the holistic notion in terms of the, uh, the understanding why x notion that is i think um you know what is it to understand quantum physics is to understand that in some sense as a kind of aggregate of of understanding why you know body of understanding why uh, you might want to finesse that in various ways but i think that's broadly in the right way so if that's true then there's no harm in focusing on this particular kind uh, we're still focusing on, on understanding in, in in a fairly general sense Okay, so here's a certain picture, which I think is very natural. Um, I think it's almost correct, um, which of course explains why it feels quite natural. I don't think it's quite correct though. I, and I, the, what's distinctive about my view is that I do depart from this. So it'll be useful to, to draw that out. So this is a view you get a lot in, uh, in philosophy of science literature, and you have versions of this in the epistemology literature as well. You know, Lipton in the first case is an obvious example, Greco in the second case. And it's a kind of reduction of, of understanding in this sense to propositional knowledge. Uh, basically understanding why is just knowing why. Knowing why is just knowing, having a certain kind of propositional explanatory knowledge, X because Y or something like that. So understanding why is just a kind of propositional knowledge. I think the natural picture is broadly on the right lines. I think that explains why it's so appealing. Um, I think it also, if it were true, it would explain what I also think is correct about understanding why is that it's factive in the relevant sense. 
uh, the target belief had better be true. If it isn't, you don't really understand. And also that it's, 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 it's an epistemic standing, understanding, right? We stand in an epistemic relationship to the, the relevant facts. Uh, of course, understanding is a kind of propositional knowledge that would explain that. But I, I don't think it's quite right. And that's because they, they come apart, knowledge and understanding, uh, in both directions. Now, the, the natural view, of course, is compatible with understanding being coming apart from knowledge in the sense of being more demanding, right? I mean, in fact, I think that that's an obvious way of thinking about what's going on here. It's not that all knowledge is understanding, but that uh, some understanding is a um, all understanding is a kind of knowing, knowing, propositional knowing. So it's a more demanding kind of propositional knowing. But I want to suggest actually it comes apart in the other direction too, um, and I think this is where it gets interesting. I think understanding is ordinarily more demanding epistemic state than uh, propositional knowing, but sometimes it can be a less demanding epistemic state. And that might seem initially puzzling, but I think when we understand what kind of thing it is, understanding, then that, that would make sense. And that's what I'm going to be trying to articulate today. So let me just first take the, uncon the, uh, the uncontentious uh, way in which knowledge and understanding come apart, that understanding can be more demanding than knowledge. The, uh, the, <laughs> the image here, by the way, is from, there's a nice website called Awkward Family Photos. Uh, and I found this one. I was looking for someone. I was looking for a house burning down, but I found this uh, someone who's to, decided to take a picture of their family, <laughs> a family shot out, outside the front of uh, their house burning down. So that's uh, uh, that's <laughs> I found it rather amusing. Okay, so we we can easily get cases where understanding comes apart from knowing in the sense that it's more demanding. Um, testimonial cases spring to mind, right? So let's say I don't think this is controversial, but it'll be useful for us just to quickly go over it. So we want a case where the agent has uh, the relevant explanatory knowledge, but uh, propositional knowledge, but they lack the, the, the associated understanding why. So you just imagine a case, the parent comes home, the house is in flames, it's burnt down, and you know, there's a fire officer there, and the fire officer explains to them what's happened, it's faulty wiring, and they understand that faulty wiring can cause a house fire and so forth. So they know, uh, they have the knowledge and they have the understanding. But we can imagine them, uh, authoritatively telling the children what happened and that the children are, are, can you know gain a knowledge from their from their parent uh, by for the most part trusting the trusting the parent i mean i think this is generally true you don't have to think about parent and a, an adult there are lots of relationships we can stand in to testify as where uh, they authoritatively assert something and and i'm thinking of this as a rational relationship by the way i'm not thinking of this as mere gullibility there are lots of situations where quite rationally we can trust the authoritative informant, thereby gain knowledge from them. The child is definitely in that uh, scenario, ordinarily. Uh, the, the adult authoritatively asserts something, the child can come to know it. And the, the adult knows that the child then comes to know it through the authoritative assertion. But for the most part, they're trusting the adult. So the child can come to know what the adult knows, but it doesn't follow that the child therefore understands what the adult understands. In particular, uh, the child might lack the set of integrated set of beliefs that are required for understanding. The child might not have a sense, have a sense of how um, faulty wiring can be the kind of thing that can cause faulty uh, cause uh, fires, right? So, <clears throat> so that seems right. Now, a few remarks about this. Um, one way of thinking about what's going on here is that uh, knowledge is more than just having a true belief. You need true. I mean, a, a mere true belief in isolation is not going to give you knowledge. When you know you. You also have other true beliefs in the vicinity. Uh, that's an entailment of you knowing. I'm not analyzing knowledge in terms of that. I'm saying it's an entailment of it. So knowing involves a cluster of true beliefs. Understanding why seems to involve uh, a richer cluster of true beliefs than, than merely knowing why, right? You can know why by just having a, a more limited set of beliefs. Understanding why requires a more integrated set. In particular, it requires true beliefs about, you know, in this case, how faulty wiring can cause fires and uh, and that seems that seems right that understanding has has that entailment a richer set of true beliefs that's what the uh, the child lacks but the adult has i'm not analyzing it in terms of that set by the way i'm just saying that's a, a consequence uh, i'll give my account of what understanding is in a moment the other thing i want to say and that this throws people a little bit understanding obviously admits of degrees so an electrician i take it would have a richer understanding of of how faulty wiring can cause fires than the parent does, who's just a layperson. 
Uh, and presumably there's people with even richer understandings here, like scientists or what have you, or forensic scientists, let's say, people who study these things, uh, you know, study house fires. Um, so yes, of course, there's a rich, and we can think of that in terms of the richer understanding entails, you know, more integrated uh, and, set, and richer set of true beliefs that they have in this regard. But that, that understanding of degree is, is incompatible with there being a threshold, right? And so the suggestion is that the parent has crossed the threshold, even if there's people with more richer understandings in this regard, their understanding is rich enough. The child, however, I'm suggesting doesn't. So the child, both of them pass the threshold for knowing, uh, only the parent has passed the threshold for understanding. I think that's the right way to think about these kind of cases. So that's not meant to be controversial. What is controversial is the thought that um, you could have understanding without knowledge. So let me try and say a little bit about that. And, and to get to this, I want to talk about um, epistemic luck. So you might, I mean, I'm primarily interested in here in what I call veritic epistemic luck, which is the, of the, the knowledge undermining epistemic luck. So this is veritic epistemic luck is when you have a true belief. And given the way that belief was formed, it's just a matter of luck that it's true. Um, if, uh, if you focus on the standard ways, standard form of rhetoric epistemic luck, then you would be forgiven for thinking that understanding and knowledge, uh, come up, they, they, they stand or fall together on this, on this score. And that's because the standard form of this is what I call, uh, intervening, uh, veritic luck. So intervening is where something is, it where it gets in the way, it gets between the belief and the fact. This is what you get in standard Gettier style cases. And it seems right to me that when we're talking about that intervening kind of veritic epistemic luck, uh, it's true where under, it undermines both knowledge and understanding equally. So, I mean, just to give you the flavor, what, what, think about a standard Gettier case, like, um, you know, the Chisholm sheep case. You know, the person's looking in the field, they think they see a sheep, but they see a sheep shaped object hidden from view. It obscures the hidden from view sheep. Uh, which is behind the sheep-shaped object. So, you know, you have a very vivid uh, depiction there of this something that's intervening, something getting in the way. Well, you can construct similar cases for understanding. So, uh, you know, imagine the parent comes home, uh, it's similar to before, they see that there's a fire officer there, or what they think is the fire officer, and they, the fire officer gives them the story about why the house burned down. And everything they're told is true. Right, so the st same story about faulty wiring, and it's all true. However, now we just imagine that what they're talking, the person they're talking to is not a real fire officer. It's someone on the way to a fancy dress party, dressed as a fire officer, they decide to, uh, they, for, for fun, they decide that they want to pretend for the day to be a fire officer, they see the fire. Just they happen to say all the right things. It seems right to me, you don't get knowledge uh, of why the house burnt down from talking to a faulty fire uh, a fake fire officer and i don't think you get understanding either so you don't stand in the right kind of epistemic relationship to the facts it seems to me the intervening epistemic luck undermines uh, your understanding so if you only focus on that kind of rhetoric epistemic luck then i think you'd be forgiven for thinking well knowledge when knowledge gets undermined by epistemic luck so does understanding but as i've tried to argue um, there's actually two kinds of rhetoric epistemic luck uh, there's intervening, and there's also what I call environmental. And I think they have different properties, and they relate in interesting ways to uh, uh, notions that are in the vicinity, such as, as I'll explain, cognitive achievement. Okay, so environmental epistemic luck. Environmental epistemic luck is, is also a form of rhetoric epistemic luck. So it's, it's, um, it's also a case where, given how you form your belief, it's a matter of luck that your belief is true. But nothing is intervening between belief and fact. Rather, the luck confirms exclusively concerns features of the environment. So the obvious way, I mean, the, the natural case to hang this on is, is a barn facade type case. So remember, in the barn facade case, you really do see the barn. It's not only sheep case. You know, you think you see, it's not like you think you see a barn, but it's not a barn. But, but you really are in you know, cognitive contact with the barn. It's just that there are features of the environment, which means that nonetheless, given the way you formed your belief, it's a matter of luck that your belief is true. Could have easily been looking at one of the, the barn facades in the vicinity. Well, we can construct a similar case um, for understanding. And I think here, or so I will suggest, our intuitions diverge. Um, 
And uh, yeah, well, uh, okay. So here I think our intuition is diverged. Let me just give you the case first and then I'll remark about it. So imagine a scenario now where the, the parent comes home and they talk to the real fire officer. So everything's genuine on that score. But we, we as it were, we barn facaded. So we imagine, let's say there were lots of fire officers milling around outside the house. I mean, I, I think that's probably what's well, usually the case when you come home to a burning building, there isn't a single fire officer, there's a bunch of them. But let's say that actually there was only one real fire officer there. All the others are they're people on the way to a fancy dress party and they they stopped off and they, you know, if you'd if you'd spoken to them, they would have they would have pretended to be fire officers. But you didn't, you just happened to talk to the one real fire officer uh, on the scene. So my intuitions go very strongly. Environmental epistemic luck, I think, is undermines knowledge. So you, you can't have um, you can't have it can't be that the way you, given the way you formed your belief is just a matter of luck it's, it's true and you still know so i think it undermines knowledge that seems clear to me I'll come back to that um does it undermine understanding though i think here when you start to think about it it's just not clear to me that it does in fact over time i've come to the view that it actually it clearly doesn't i mean think about it i mean you 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 really do have I think we want to say uh, a good understanding of why the house burnt down. I mean, you got it, you gained it in the right kind of way. Uh, it's all true. Uh, it all, it's a set of beliefs. It all integrates in the right kind of way and so on and so forth. So I think when you start to think about this, once you make the distinction between intervening and environmental epistemic luck, we get a divergence starting to appear. <coughs> a few things to say about this. First one is a bit of methodology. One thing I've noticed with philosophers is that when you give a case, people think, aha, the whole thing hangs on the case. Actually, it doesn't. The case is kind of illustrative. The whole thing really hangs upon how everything, as we, uh, there's a whole story I want to tell about why this is so, a diagnostic story. That's what it hangs upon. The case is kind of illustrative at that point. So, um, you know, <laughs> don't stop listening now is basically the point. Don't think, oh, well, I've got the case, now I can stop listening, because everything else is important to understanding what's going on here. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about this is, um, uh, yeah, so of course, some people uh, have, re you know, have responded to this distinction between intervening and environmental epistemic luck to say uh, that maybe knowledge is compatible with environmental epistemic luck. I I'll reference this as we go along. Um, it, just now, I just want to flag, because some of you may be familiar with this, Sosa is the most famous example of this, but there's at least two things to mention about this now. I mean, obviously, that if that's right, then that's a, that, that would change the dialectical landscape here quite significantly. I'm suggesting that veritic epistemic luck is just simply incompatible with knowing. Two things I want to say about it, though. The first is that um, this is clearly theory-driven, and I, that's not meant to be a, a jibe. Often we have to make theory-driven moves. And I think as theory-driven moves go, this is a pretty good one. The idea is the very good theory, but it has this consequence. So they embrace the consequence. But it is theory-driven. I mean, most of these authors, I mean, Sosa is very open about this. Um, most people would accept, would accept that antecedently, you'd think that any kind of veritic epistemic luck would be incompatible with knowing. So it's only in the grip of a certain view, which people find persuasive, and I think rightly so, because it's a good view, that they go down that route. Uh, on the other hand, I'm trying to develop a view which doesn't have that, that consequence. So you, you, we stick to our antecedent thoughts about this. The second thing is that I, I actually have further things to say about why, which I won't go into much today, because I don't really have time, but further things to say about why environmental epistemic luck would be incompatible with knowing. I mean, these days I'm motivated in terms of epistemic risk. I think we, we care about epistemic luck because we care about epistemic risk. So that's the primary notion here. And I think it's much harder to uh, defend the claim of, of environmental epistemic luck is compatible with knowledge. Once you realize that what you're in effect defending is this idea that um, you can have uh, knowledge in cases where there's a high epistemic risk of your belief so formed being, being false, being an error. So I think there are things to say there, um, but I, you know, I just want to just flag, there, there is an issue about this. But if you follow me, and you don't go down that route, then and another vista opens up. If suppose we take seriously this divergence between understanding knowledge, how would we explain it? What would it tell us about the uh, these notions that are in play? And here an outline is the diagnosis, which I, I want to unpack. So, you know, why might understanding of knowledge have a different relationship to epistemic luck? I I think when we start to reflect on on what these uh, epistemic states are and what they're doing then I think we realize that they're serving distinct purposes, and that's why they have this different profile. 
So knowledge, I want to suggest, serves a dual purpose. Um, there's an agency component, and I, we could, that is, when you know, it has to be down to your cognitive agency in some significant way. I'm going to refer to this as a weak cognitive achievement. I'll explain what that means. So it's, it's quite a weak agency requirement, but it, there is an agency requirement in there. You can't know, as it were, and your cognitive success not be in any significant way down to your cognitive agency. It's got to be down to you, but weakly. I think there's also a dimension in knowing which is about the elimination of epistemic risk. Uh, and I think once you understand that these two constraints are in play, and in particular, once you understand that satisfying the first constraint will eliminate some kinds of epistemic risk immediately, but it won't eliminate all kinds of epistemic risk, then you realize that you need a sort of dual, what I call a dual factor way of thinking about knowledge. It's not simply two conditions, it's because the conditions, as it were, intersect with one another, they overlap. Um, but it, it says, well, you need a theory of knowledge which responds to the two, two distinct constraints, what I call anti-luck or anti-risk virtue epistemology. Understanding, though, I think isn't like that. I don't think there is this element to understanding. I don't think it has a separate element about eliminating epistemic risk. I think understanding is rather, uh, it, 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 it's uh, entirely about a certain kind of agency. In particular, I think it's about um, a certain uh, it's a cognitive success that's down to a manifestation of cognitive agency in a very strong sense. And it's with what I'm going to call strong cognitive achievement. So along one axis, understanding is more demanding than knowing, right? Along the agency axis, cognitive agency axis. But it also it doesn't have this other axis, right? The anti-risk one. And I think once we start, once we understand that, we can understand why uh, knowledge in general would be more uh, epistemically demanding than knowing because it's more demanding along the agency axis. But there's also these unusual cases where uh, you have understanding without knowing. That's because understanding on this view would be compatible with certain kinds of epistemic risk. In particular, the kind of epistemic risk you get in cases of environmental epistemic luck. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so let me try and um, work this out. Okay, I want to talk about achievements now. So I've already, I've already mentioned um, a kind of taxonomy here. Let me say a little bit more about this. Uh, I think we could think about achievements and I bracketed cognitive because the thought is that what I'm saying here would apply to achievements in general, but I, I'm also obviously interested in the subclass of this, which is concerned with cognitive achievements, you know, true beliefs uh, formed in an appropriate way. I think we can uh, differentiate three different layers, you know, weak, moderate, and strong sense of achievement, cognitive achievement. I'm going to say from the off, my view is that the ordinary language notion of achievement corresponds to the strong notion. So when we ordinarily talk about achievement, that's what we have in mind, not the weak or the moderate notion. Um, but there are, uh, we can see how the weak and the moderate notion are kind of approximations to the strong one. And, uh, and it'll be useful for our purposes to, to, to bring them out. So the weak notion is the idea that you're... So, so, th so think about achievement. There's more to achievements than just success, obviously. <laughs> You have to have agency in there. There has to be some sort of skillful agency bringing about the success. Success through dumb luck is an achievement. But there also has to be the right kind of explanatory relationship between the success and the agency, right? You know, if you have agency and success, but there's no relationship, explanatory relationship between the two, you know, you, you've got agency over here and success over here, and there's nothing that connects them, then it wouldn't count as achievement. You need the right kind of explanatory connection. Well, what kind of explanatory connection might it be? Well, here's one. You could, um, a very weak one, uh, your, your agency plays some significant role in your, in your, in your success. So think about the archer case with the archer on, the, on, the, power, on the, the image here. You know, this might be a case where you're a novice archer, you're learning to, learning to fire an arrow, and let's say an expert archer puts their arms around you and, and guides you, you know, they guide your, uh, your, your placement, they guide your release and so on, and you hit the target. So you, your agency is playing some role, right? I mean, your coordination is, is, is relevant here, your eyesight and so forth. Um, it's playing a significant role. We can construct the case so that we, you definitely satisfy that, that part of it. Um, but it's not, it, it's not the overarching part. I mean, it, it, it's not primarily attributable to you that you hit the target. Uh, we could, uh, the, the achievement as a whole, as it were, is, is, is attributable, let's say, to the union of you and the expert, or maybe you might think it's attributable to the expert, but it's not attributable to you. But still, we might say in a weak sense, we've got a kind of achievement there. As I'll explain, I think a lot of testimonial cases are a bit like this. 
Um, so you've got a cognitive achievement uh, and you're, you're playing some significant role. Gullibility, I don't think, is a route to testimonial knowledge. So you need to be playing some significant role. Your cognitive agency needs to be playing some significant role. But it doesn't have to be the overarching role, and that will be compatible with knowing. Then there's a stronger notion called here moderate achievement. That's where your success is primarily uh, attributable to your agency. So the overarching element of the causal explanation of your success is, is your agency. So this would be like, you know, the archery case, but now remove the, you know, you're not a novice anymore, remove the expert, he's not helping you. And you're firing the arrow and you're hitting the target. Success that's because of abilities is often said. And a lot of people are persuaded by the thought that maybe knowledge is essentially that, right? It's cognitive success because of cognitive ability, primarily due to your cognitive abilities. It certainly would fit with a, um, a lot of what we know. Obviously, as I've just explained, not all of it, right? Because of testimonial cases. Uh, I think you can know, even though it's not primarily down to you. Um, but lots of cases are like that. Why might you think this isn't the ordinary language notion of achievement? And the reason I think is that uh, achievements here can be very, very easy on this view. I mean, I'm raising my hand. <laughs> Success because of ability, right? I mean, lots of lots of achievements. If this is what achievement is, is uh, amounts to, is is a, a pretty pretty easily easily had. I don't think we we think of achievements as being easy that way. You know, think about the archery case. You know, being able to just fire an arrow in broadly the right direction would count as an achievement. Success down to your abilities. Uh, I don't think we would ordinarily class that. A lot of our um, a lot of our knowledge is like that, though. You know, think of our perceptual knowledge. I open my eyes in the morning and I, I know various things. It's a bit like the raising of one's hand. You know, the success is attributable to my cognitive abilities, um, but it, it, I don't think we would naturally class that as a cognitive achievement. So this brings us to the strong notion of achievement, uh, which I think is closely is what we mean by the ordinary language notion. It's the the moderate notion plus uh, one of two conditions. Either there's going to be a relatively high level of cognitive ability on display, or there's the overcoming of a significant obstacle to one's success. So, I mean, think about raising one's hand. You know, um, raising one's hand is an achievement in, in the ordinary language sense. But, you know, if, if one's hand is in a cast and you raise it, then it could be an achievement. You know, you're over, or if someone's trying to hold your arm down and you raise it, then it could be an achievement. So when, there's, when you're overcoming obstacles, I think we think of it as a, a, an achievement in the ordinary language sense. There's also cases where, you know, like the highly skilled person, you know, the highly skilled archer hits the bullseye. You know, they can do it every time. It's easy for them. But it still counts as an achievement because even though it's easy for them, there's no obstacle for them. But that is, it's an achievement because, you know, relative to the background, there's a high level of, um, of cognitive ability on display. So I think that's the strong notion of achievement. Now, what I'm going to be um, uh, suggesting is that um, the knowledge it demands at most the weak notion, but that understanding is essentially to be understood in terms of the strong notion. So <clears throat> I've already mentioned some of this, but let me just quickly say, you know, in testimonial cases, I think, you know, you can have knowledge in the, just in the weak sense, the weak cognitive achievement sense. I think this captures when the, there's an agency requirement on knowledge, but I think it's quite a weak one. It's just this one. And that's why we can know in testimonial cases. Um, what gets interesting, though, is when we start to think about the moderate view and indeed the strong view, they stand in a different relationship to epistemic luck. Um, so uh, to, there's a different relation to the different kinds of epistemic luck. And I think this is where it gets very interesting. So, I mean, think about, um, let's just take moderate cognitive achievements. Although what we apply here, we'll say here will apply to the strong view as well. I mean, think about the archer, right? So we're just talking about achievements in general. You know, the archer fires the arrow, skillfully hits the target. Uh, we can imagine two ways that luck could intervene. It could, um, could encroach here. One is intervening. So imagine like a, a wind machine blows the arrow off course, and then another wind machine blows it back on course again. This would be like the intervening luck. I think that would undermine achievement, right? It's not your achievement anymore. Uh, I mean, you've got the success, you've got the ability, but you know, we wouldn't say that you, it's not because of your success. It's not primarily because of your abilities that you're successful. Actually, it's the, the wind machine gets the, uh, gets the plaudits there. But notice the difference now to the uh, environmental case. I mean, imagine a case where you skillfully fire the arrow and you hit the target. Nothing gets in the way. Nothing intervenes. 
Um, but you're in an environment, let's say, where, where nonetheless, it's a, it's a matter of luck that you hit the target. Let's say there was a wind machine all set up and uh, it fused at the last minute. The wind machine would have knocked your arrow off course, but it, it didn't. Um, so we could even say, like in lots of close possible worlds, you, you failed to hit the target right now. So your, your success is modally fragile. It's a success that could have easily been failure. Is this any less of an achievement? It seems to me that it's no less of an achievement, right? Nothing actually going in the way. I mean, something gets in the way, it undermines achievement. Something that could have easily get in the way, but it doesn't, it doesn't undermine achievement. And I actually think this is a general point about agency and our agency attributions. Uh, there are lots of things that can influence our attributions of agency, but you know, the mere possibility of something intervening, right, doesn't undermine agency attributions. It's no less of an achievement. I mean, if you you know think about this, you know, think about you know Robin Hood, think about a case, you know, would we something would have got in the way, but it didn't, you know, is any less of an achievement of Robin Hood's, you know. I think when you start to flesh this out, it seems pretty clear that something could have got in the way but didn't, doesn't undermine your achievement. And that's interesting. I mean, it should be very interesting for our purposes, given what we said about understanding earlier on. Um, yeah, so here's what I want to say. I want to knowledge that minimally entails WCA. Often knowledge will entail the moderate, it involves a moderate notion as well. Remember the moderate notion can be satisfied quite easily, like perceptual cases and so forth. Understanding though, I think is more demanding. And I think it goes hand in hand with the strong cognitive achievement. It's not the kind of thing that one can gain easily and passively, like um, perceptual knowledge. And if that's right, then we've got a, a, a nice way of understanding why uh, knowledge and understanding come apart in the way they do as regards epistemic luck. Understanding is essentially about the strong kind of cognitive agency on display. It doesn't have this epistemic risk component. So that's why it has this compatibility with the environmental epistemic luck and not with the, and not with the um, the intervening kind. I won't go into this, but you know, um, for if you know any of the literature on this, I mean, because of the, for the reasons I say the things that I do here, it's also the reasons why I reject a certain view about knowledge, robust virtue epistemology, as I call it, which essentially is the view that knowledge just is a moderate cognitive achievement. Um, I think it gets pulled asunder because it's both in a sense too strong and too weak, but I, I won't go into that. Sort of view you get different forms, Sosa, Greco, Zygzebski and others. Okay, let's try and flesh this out a bit more then. So the, the early modern period, there's this very, you know, people often talk about the differences between passive and active knowing. I think for our purposes, it'd be less tendentious to talk about passive and active cognition. Knowledge is the kind of thing which can be acquired entirely passively. That is, you know, trust, trusting a knowledgeable informant, opening one's eyes and perceiving one's environment. Uh, in that sense, knowing can be quite easily acquired. Understanding, though, looks to be an essentially active uh, cognitive state. And this would explain, if that's true, that would explain why it goes hand in hand with strong cognitive achievements, where knowledge doesn't. You know, I, I, I can know a mathematical theorem by trusting the expert, um, but, uh, but I, I understand it by being able to, you know, follow through the proof myself, right? Um, I can't just, I can't merely trust in the expert, it doesn't give me understanding, it might give me knowing. Uh, you know, opening one's eyes might give you perceptual knowledge, but you need something like observation, interrogation of the environment, right? Critical interrogation of the environment to gain understanding of anything through your perception. So I think we can start to see there with a the passive active distinction why understanding might involve uh, uh, strong cognitive achievement. You know, one is able to fit the relevant pieces together. For certain people who have, you know, elevated cognitive skills, that might be spontaneous. I'm going to give the example in a moment to Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes might understand things very quickly, um, but that's because elevated cognitive skill isn't on display. For most people, though, understanding involves uh, overcoming a kind of cognitive obstacle, which is, you know, we have the, there is the, the, the active part is required. The things don't come to us put together. We have to put them together. Uh, reasoning is required and so forth. So this is what I'm suggesting. You know, we've got this interesting feature I'm arguing. Uh, moderate and strong cognitive achievements, moderate, moderate and strong achievements in general, are compatible with environmental epistemic luck. They're not compatible with intervening luck. Uh, you know, your success can be modally fragile due to environmental factors. It doesn't undermine the achievement. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that understanding now ends up having the same profile as a strong cognitive achievement, and that this is no accident. 
right? It's more demanding than knowledge along one axis, cognitive agency axis, right? Because it's it's not just the kind of thing that can be acquired passively or weakly. It, it, it requires the stronger notion of cognitive agency. But also, unlike knowledge, it can be compatible with environmental epistemic love because that's all it demands. It doesn't have this further component of eliminating epistemic risk. Okay, I'm not going to go into this, um, but if I'll just mention this here, I think you can further motivate this point by appealing to what I call epistemic twin earth cases. I mean, the basic idea behind epistemic twin earth cases is keep everything fixed across earth and twin earth that could possibly be relevant to agency. You know, metaphysical duplicates, identical causal histories, earth and twin earth have the same local environments, right? That's the things you causally interact with. The same global environments, that's the things you'd ordinarily causally interact with. All they differ in is their modal environment. And now you ask questions about the agents on, on S and twin S here and about their beliefs, you know, the beliefs about water, let's say, whether it's H2O. You know, when, you, when we're making beliefs that are purely about attributions of agency, it seems to me our attributions are, co are constant across the two cases because everything relevant to agency stays fixed. But if, uh, insofar as we're talking about knowledge though, it's get interesting, it seems to me then our attributions diverge because now, because there's the epistemic risk dimension, the epistemic luck dimension knowledge, uh, it is relevant that there's a close possibility of error on twin earth that isn't there on, on earth. Okay, so let me just get to the get to the end then now. Um, so I've argued that understanding and knowledge, they come apart in both directions. I've, understand that, I've argued that understanding is a kind of what I call strong cognitive achievement, and that's what sets it apart. That's why it has this unusual relationship to um, environmental epistemic risk, because that's what, um, <laughs> that's what strong cognitive achievements have. Uh, so it explains why it's much more demanding sometimes and also sometimes less demanding than knowing. Uh, this, way, this way of thinking about uh, understanding, I think, gives us a handle on why we might think understandings are especially valuable. I think it does seem plausible that they are. Well, and one natural story now about their value appeals to the value of achievement. Arguably, they're a final value and thus have a kind of pro tanto value. I mean, of course, it's defeasible, right? Um, pro tanto value, pro tanto value is under, in, under uh, undercut, but it is overridden, right? It can be outweighed by other factors. Um, uh, so, but but still, uh, it has a special, you, you, you know, we can talk about things having a special kind of value even if they're you know, outweighed by other considerations. And understandings, achievements, look like the kind of thing that has that special kind of value. Uh, I mean, we might put it in terms of like a kind claim, you know, tigers are fierce, kind of a kind of thing that are fierce. Maybe there are some tigers that aren't they're tame, right? That's compatible with that claim. Understanding is the kind of thing that's of special value, you know, even if sometimes there, there are achievements, understandings that aren't of any particular value. Uh, this would also explain why things that fall short of understanding lack that value, because of course they fall short of achievements in the ordinary language sense that we're interested in. So that's one way to explain the value of knowledge. I think actually there are multiple routes here. So that would be the direct route. You just say, well, they're a kind of achievement. Achievements have a special kind of value. There's also indirect routes though. Uh, you could appeal in the, you could appeal to the, um, the way in which achievements have eudaimonic value. And then eudaimonic value, of course, is final value. So if you think achievements have a special role to play in a life of flourishing, which seems very plausible to me, um, you know, I think there are, there are various conditions of a life of flourishing, you know, conditions which, if not satisfied, would undermine one's flourishing. A lack of free freedom would be one of them, for example. Like, you know, the truth skeptical, truth of skeptical scenarios would be another, I think. But I think, you know, if, if one's life, it doesn't involve any achievements. So it's, it's continually ghettoized in the intervening sense uh, once success is. I think that would undermine uh, eudaimonic value. So if that's right, if understanding is the kind of thing that has that role to play in a, in a life flourishing, then that would give you a way, and also a way of motivating it, you know, motivating it indirectly now, not directly appeal to the value of achievements, but indirectly in, in, by appeal to the role achievements play in, in a life of flourishing, which is a final value. <coughs> I think there's a related thought here. <clears throat> which connects to the intellectual virtues. And I think this last point dovetails with this. You know, I've already talked about how understanding is like kind of like an active cognition as opposed to knowing which can be had passively. 
there's a way of thinking about the intellectual virtues that goes hand in hand with this. I mean, it's often said that the intellectual virtues are geared towards propagating understanding rather than their knowledge. And often it's also said that they're essentially active rather than passive cognitive states. I mean, think about Holmes and Watson. Right? Holmes and Watson, they're presented with the same visual scene. Watson, in his plodding way, you know, he perceives, a, they both perceive a great deal from the scene, but Holmes has these intellectual virtues, in particular the power of observation, and he interrogates the scene and thereby comes to understand things that Holmes doesn't. It seems there's an active kind of cognition that's in play uh, with, uh, with Holmes, which is leading to understanding, and this seems to be especially valuable. Uh, you know, we can appeal here either directly to the value of the intellectual virtues or more indirectly just to the, the value of the virtue, the eudaimonic value of the virtues. Uh, by the way, I, 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 I think truth is a fundamental epistemic good, but I think everything I've said is compatible with that. Some people take this line of argument to say, well, it's understanding that's fundamental epistemic good. I, I don't think that, but well, <laughs> ask me about that if you want. I think this also fits in with a picture about the epistemic goals of education, which I find uh, attractive. And this is the last point I'll make. Uh, you know, there's this crude picture of the epistemic, I mean, education serves many goals, social, practical, uh, uh, political. Uh, but one of its goals is epistemic. You know, we're trying to cultivate certain kinds of epistemic states in the subject. Um, there is a crude view in which we're, we're interested in sort of passive epistemic states, true belief, justified true belief, uh, knowledge, know-how. But I think, and many educational theorists agree with this, that actually a more plausible conception is in terms of these active epistemic states, that is cultivating intellectual character. Some people like Harvey Siegel understand this just in terms of, sort of critical faculties, but I think actually what we're more interested in is, is a richer notion in terms of virtuous intellectual character. That is, virtuous intellectual subjects are actively and autonomously seek out understanding, not merely passively acquire knowledge. Uh, but I think, again, that goes hand in hand with a, a view of understanding is essentially involved in this strong cognitive achievement. Okay, so this is, um, I, I want to suggest understanding is not a kind of knowledge, it often is, but it's, it, it's not ultimately. It can sometimes fall short of knowledge in virtuous relation to environmental epistemic luck. I think recognizing this point enables to see how understanding relates to strong cognitive achievements, i.e. The, the, the ordinary language notion of achievement, Therefore, both in a sense more demanding and in a sense less demanding than knowledge. And finally, I think this helps us to understand how understanding has the special value that it does, and in particular, it can integrate it into a, a virtue theoretic epistemic picture, right? A way of thinking about the intellectual virtues is especially valuable as leading to understanding. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Duncan. And I already see that everybody is joining me and using the virtual applause button. Oh, we very much appreciate it. And uh, I already see a couple of hands from Stephen and Chris, naturally. Uh, and uh, without further ado, Stephen, please go ahead. Hi, Duncan. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much. And I apologize for getting my hand up so quickly. I have to leave in like five minutes, but I just wanted to see what you thought about something. Okay, excellent. So, um, so in terms of strong uh, cognitive achievement, uh, I, I wonder about that. So, uh, and I wonder whether many instances of understanding can't be just very passive, very automatic. So I'm imagining, so imagine I have, um, you know, three little blocks, like I'm playing with a child and I, and I put up, I build like three blocks on top, top of one another. And uh, I, I push over this tower of blocks. Now it seems like I understand where the blocks fell over, why the tower fell down. It seems like the smallest child could understand why the tower fell down. You know, it wasn't because of the wind. It wasn't because the cat just walked in. It was because I pushed the blocks. I'm tempted to say that's almost as automatic as the kind of examples that, you know, Jason Bear uses where like you're in the library and the lights turn out and you just automatically form the belief that the lights turn out. It, doesn't that seem to you like as passive, as automatic, you know, my understanding of why the tower fell down as these other kinds of things? Well, that's yeah, a leading question, maybe. I say, does it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Steve. Good to see you, by the way. Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, I have been, I have been, I've been wondering about this, just how strong I want to make the claim. 
so so here's one thought I had. Um, I mean, I could retreat here. I could say, and, I, and I'm sort of I'm sort of tempted either way. You know, do I need the strong claim that it always involves strong cognitive achievement, or is it enough for my purposes that it's kind of? Do I want to say like it's a kind of a kind of kind claim? You know, like I mentioned, tigers being fierce. Maybe understanding is the kind of thing that it essentially involves what I'm calling strong cognitive achievements, but maybe not always. So that's one that's one possibility I've sort of played around with. I guess I'm inclined to to kind of stick to my guns on this and actually not retreat. I mean, I think there is that retreat there available to me. Um, you know, because I, I think maybe there is a kind of elevated skill. I mean, so we've got to be careful about these cases where it's it's very quick and easy. Of course, on my view, it can be quick and easy if there's elevated skill involved. Um, and we might think to ourselves, well, OK, so maybe there's no elevated skill involved right now. Or, or that is, maybe there's no obviously elevated skill involved right now. But if we are, in, in fact, attributing understanding, I think we are thinking that somehow either the person has put... Put, put put the parts together previously, right? So there's overcoming, in which case they're kind of trading on a, on a previous overcoming of obstacles. Or we're thinking that somehow they're, they're doing it like that, right? They didn't do that before, but now they're doing it like that. I mean, the child doesn't do that, I take it. But the adult might do that. But if they do, then I think that kind of looks a bit like an elevated skill, right? If they, you know, if they haven't previously put it together, but now they can do it like that. So I, I think, you know, cases like this, you know, I could go either way. I have, I have had anxiety exactly along those lines. So I think you've pinpointed one thing I'm worried about here. That's thanks for that. Um, yeah. but, I, I, but I sort of think there's there's a retreat available, which I think is plausible. But I also think there's a way of make of sticking to one's guns. You know, by unpacking the case such that, you know, really properly understood, it's either trading on a previous overcoming of obstacles, or it, it, if it isn't, then well, that is pretty skillful, right? Elevated skill. Right. Thanks, Duncan. And sorry, I got to run. Great to see you all. Yeah, take care. All right. Thanks so much, Stephen and Duncan, for answering. Next up, we have Chris. Chris, please go ahead. Hey, Duncan. Good to see you. Thanks for the talk. It's yes. really great. Um, I had the same question as Stephen, so uh, I, I'm just going to follow up. Um, I basically, you know, along similar lines, just a slightly different angle. So it seems to me as though. Um, you know, I mean, the way in which you dis uh, describe strong cognitive achievements, uh, what whether some particular thing, right, understanding of some why some proposition is true, uh, is a strong cognitive achievement that, like you know, might vary from one person to the next, right, and 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 vary with the prevalence of certain skills, like you know, I mean. Um, um, in, in, for like you know, for some people, certain things are hard and constitute serious obstacles that for other people aren't, right? And it might, for instance, happen that uh, at some point down the line, half the population gets the skill that they suddenly can do this thing really easily like that, right? And the other half, for some reason, can't. Um, and I mean, basically, it, it looks as though if you want to say that understanding is essentially a strong cognitive achievement, um, then you would have to say that like, you know, half the population is now understanding and the other half isn't. But that doesn't seem like, you know, to fit very well with the sort of thing that we want understanding um, to be. Um, so, so that's tricky. And I'm, I'm also not so sure that, that it still fits very easily with the kind claim, right? Because in the scenario that I'm envisaging, like half the population is, is doing it like that and the other half is finding it very difficult. Uh, so anyway, that was just a case that I had in mind, and I was wondering what you thought about it. Yeah, another great question. This is something I've, I've, had, <laughs> I've been worried about, actually. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's true. I, I guess I do want to say that, um, you know, whether one, because what, what, what counts as achievement does seem to be relative to the background. And, uh, you know, as I say, like, um, if, if, you know, if one's arm is in a cast, then raising one's arm is an achievement in a way that normally raising one's arm isn't. And, you know, if you follow through that kind of reasoning, then if suddenly for most people raising one's arm becomes a very difficult thing to do, then whereas hitherto raising one's arm was an achievement, now it is a uh, strong achievement. So, you know, I, I, it does seem right that if you go down that route, then uh, what can, and if you think understanding is essentially a strong achievement now, then understanding seems to be always relative to the background. And, uh, and I do have an anxiety, like, so how far do I want to push that? Um, I guess it'd be helpful to hear a bit more about 
because yeah, I haven't been able to put my finger on exactly, I, I do have an anxiety about it, but I haven't been able to put my finger, put my finger on exactly why I'm worried by it, by it. Maybe you could tell me a bit more about why I think I should be. So, so take the case you give. I'm not sure that's a worry, right? So, you know, maybe, um, you know, it, it, we, in fact, you know, we could even, you know, we could imagine communities where, I mean, I think this is kind of true now, actually, you know, technological advance and the availability of a certain information means that it's certain things now, certain cognitive acts seem like less of an achievement than they were before. Um, uh, right. So, so is that, and, and, you know, so maybe now understand, you know, we, we wouldn't credit people with understanding in a way we would before because they, we wouldn't think that the, the, there's an achievement. I guess I'm kind of tempted to think, well, maybe that's not so bad actually. So I don't know, maybe say me a bit more. Why would it be so bad? I, 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 like I share your anxiety. I think there's something, there's something worrying, something nagging me about this, but I'm not altogether sure why it would be so bad to think, well, yeah, you know, as we progress, you know, understand certain things which would have counted as understanding before, where you had to put things together and, you know, people had to go off to a library or whatever and understand, now they get it easily. We don't credit that now with understanding. That kind of thing seems about right to me, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking of, I mean, I'm, you know, giving a case. Uh, I mean, if maybe we can go with Stephen's case, like, you know, I mean, so suddenly, like, you know, for, for half the population, it's really easy to see why, you know, the the, the thing falls down, uh, well, why, to understand why the, the tower fell down just by looking. Um, it, it probably doesn't help, the, the half the population thing, because, I mean, let, they have to be like the majority, wouldn't it, or something like that, or, uh, I mean, I don't know, the half wants to, I don't know how that, it, it kind of creates a bit of noise with their intuitions because now we've got these kind of two different. I mean, imagine most people suddenly we evolve and we have some capacity. So now it wouldn't count as elevated skill. If it's like half, does it count as elevated skill? I don't know. But if most people get it, it doesn't count as elevated skill anymore. So it's only the people who don't have it, they count as having the achievement. The ones that have the elevated, the elevated skill becomes the norm. So it's not elevated anymore. I take it that's the thought, right? So then it's not, a, it's not an understanding for them. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but, but, but I, mean, but, but me I guess I, I, I that, my thought was, you know, we could, we could, is that so bad, right? I mean, you know, just as some things when they get too easy, they wouldn't count as understanding, right? If they, if they are genuinely passive and there is no elevated skill involved, well, then I, would we, would we continue to treat it as understanding? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking like the other half of the population maybe like, you know, suffers some brain damage or something like that and now they have to do it in this really laborious way right yeah. um and so now now you know there's two people and they end up with exactly the same beliefs right um uh, about why the tower fell down uh, but like you know the one who did it easily doesn't understand why the tower fell down whereas the one who had to do the laborious thing uh does understand why the tower fell down and that just i mean to me that strikes me as a, as a little bit weird yeah although i think we could still talk there about the people who find it easy they understand through the elevated it would still make sense to talk about elevated skill right that was where i was getting at how how, how prevailing is it because it seems like that's still an elevated skill if half the people don't have it so you could you could explain their understanding in terms of elevated skill and the other people's understanding in terms of overcoming of obstacles there wouldn't be a difference there the, the more worrying case, I think, is where it becomes so prevailing that we can't appeal to elevated skill anymore. Um, but then I guess my thought is, well, but then, you know, if, if, if suddenly overnight, you know, we can just as opening your eyes, you can see things just, you know, there are certain things you understand. You know, let's say God implants it in you or something like that. I'm not sure we would now consider it an understanding anymore. So I, I'm, I'm kind of torn here. Yeah, I, 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 I agree that... Um, we might antecedently have thought that understanding ought not to be, ought not to vary in terms of these sort of conditions and the way our clearly our achievements do. Um, but I think when you start to flesh it out, it's not clear to me that, it, that it's quite as worrying as um, that it might first appear. Thanks, Chris. All right, thanks so much, Chris and Duncan for answering. Uh, I'm very grateful to all of you guys and I'm very grateful to Emma for uh, being uh, so generous and letting us run a bit over time. Uh, so if you agree, Emma, we'll, we'll do that for a couple more minutes to, to go through the questions and then we'll move on to, to, to your talk.
Excellent. We have uh, questions from Bruce, from Adam, and then I have a quick question of my own. But first of all, we have Professor Bruce Russell from Wayne University. Please go ahead, Bruce. Hi, Duncan. How are you? Yeah, good. Hey, Bruce. Long time no see. Good to see you. Maybe we'll meet in California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Finally. Uh, but here I am in the home of Gettier at Wayne State. So uh -huh. Here's my uh, worry. It's about your apparent counterexample about going from understanding to knowledge. And then I have a general remark about understanding it. I have a kind of different theory than yours. So I'll try both these out quickly. <clears throat> so uh, what worries me about environmental luck are they're kind of intermediate cases. I agree with your intuitions in barn facade. But here's a case that Layla was on here earlier, but she's left. My colleague, uh, Here's a case of sheep in the field where the farmer every once a month or once a year or something like that puts real sheep out in the field. And you drive by and you see the sheep and you form the belief there's sheep in the field. And I think you have knowledge in that, even though it's kind of a barn facade case applied to sheep. Well, so that's why I wonder, you know, whether this is a borderline case the counter example you give about the fire marshals. But then I'll make my general point about your theory because I didn't stop listening after you gave that example. <laughs> my thought is that understanding comes in degrees. So here's an example. Uh, the pipes freeze and they crack. And I understand why, because I understand that water expands when it freezes. <laughs> However, well, let's call this guy not the fire marshal, but the water master. He understands also why water expands. He understands it forms lattices and crystals, and hence he has a deeper understanding. So my thought is really the difference between understanding, it doesn't require knowledge why, it's just that it comes in degrees, and some people can have deeper understanding than others, like in my example of the water master versus me, who just knows that water expands. So that it's doesn't, to me, it's not essentially tied to the amount of effort that it takes to, to acquire the understanding. It's just that some understanding, deeper understanding requires more effort, but that's not what's crucial to the understanding. And it really does always involve knowledge why of some level or another. All right, thanks very much. So, um, I mean, I agree with you about it coming in degrees. Um, I mean, what I wanted to suggest though, was that in, in the cases I, uh, that I envisaged that the, the, the threshold has been, has been met, right? It's a low threshold, but it's, it's been met. So someone could have a further up the threshold, but that they've still satisfied the threshold um, or not as the case may be. Um, let me just go back to the first point. That's interesting. Those cases, the intermediate cases. Um, she... I need to know the case again, but, but it, it sounded, when I first heard it, it sounded like, you know, there's this distinction evidential or circumstantial luck versus veritic epistemic luck. And roughly the distinction is that um, in, in the evidential, the circumstantial case, the luck is, as it were, prior to. So you've got this the, the event of forming the belief, and then it can't be a matter of luck given how you formed your belief that your belief ends up being true. But there can be luck, as it were, in the initial conditions prior to that. So like famous cases like Unger's case of, you know, you, you're lucky to be outside the door of your chair and walking past the very moment that she's talking loudly about something, and thereby you come to know something, you know, about departmental why, politics. Why, is, why isn't it uh, you're lucky that, let's say it's once a month, that you, you came out on the street on that day when the farmer really had real sheep, isn't that like being lucky and stopping in front of the real barn rather than the 99 or whatever facades? It seems parallel in yeah, that I mean, barn facade. I mean, I agree that there's this kind of, there's like a sort of penumbral region where it's really not clear whether, whether something is kind of part of the initial conditions for the event or whether it actually is, we should think of it as being built into what it is to form your belief in that way. I mean, I think it seems like in the bar facade cases, we have how we understand, how we individuate what it is to form your belief in the way that you did is such that you could have easily formed your belief by looking at these other things. 
In the other case, though, it's not obvious that's true. It's like, well, you know, well, given that you, it seems like, well, given that you're here with the real sheep, right? Um, of course, you could have been in, you know, we could have imagined you in easily, a different yeah. circumstance where you're not with the real yeah. sheep, but you, you are just, now with the real sheep. Yeah, you easily could have driven out on a different day and seen the poodles, who, poodles that look just like sheep. Yeah, I mean, you've been like with the, you know, the bomb, you know, we, we, once you start to go back further into the initial conditions, it's less clear that there's luck involved, right? You know, uh, yesterday, Bonfassar yeah, County came into existence. Um, Bonfassar County is about to come into existence, but it hasn't. You know, I could have gone on my trip tomorrow. Um, I'd have been in Bonfassar County, but today I'm not. But right. that seems okay, right? Now I, now I can come to know things about Barnes, um, even though, you know, the, but that's because it seems it's back in, the luck is back in the initial conditions prior to the formation of the belief. But I agree, there are these awkward cases where it's just not clear whether, and I think your cheap case might be like that. It's just not clear whether we build it in, is it prior to, or is it built into the, the, the basis for the belief? Yeah, now you have that, it shows up in the fire marshal case. So, it, it, you know, which way is it, which is the parallel case? My sheep case or barn facade? So yeah, that's I, I, clear I tried to, there. I tried to construct it though, to try and avoid that kind of, so, like in the fire marshal case, you know, they're right, they're right there. So it, it's not like, you know, they, they could have easily been there or, you know, they're around the corner or tomorrow they'd be there. Tomorrow they would have been there, but not today or so. So I try, I made them very, very much present. Uh, and it was precisely just to, to make it clear that we're not these kind of cases where it's sort of to, 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 to close off worries about the luck being in the background, as it were, and make it right in the foreground. So I was trying to sort of screen those kind of cases out, but I agree there are cases where it's just not clear which way we jump. And the reason it's not clear is it's not clear whether we want to think of them as, as, as prior to the unit, as part of the initial conditions for the event, or whether they are built into the event themselves. Yeah. So All right. right. Thank you so much, yeah, Bruce. This has been uh, this has yeah. been quite a terrific line of inquiry, and thanks so much, Duncan, for answering. We have Adam and uh, Thomas waiting, and I don't want to keep them for too long. Adam, please go ahead. Hey, Duncan. Good to, hey, see you. Adam, good to see you. And great stuff as always. Um, I just got a quick question. So I'm, I'm with the you glass, on the fire. The Glasgow contingent are here mob handed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm, I'm with you on the fire officer cases. I think in the, in, the, in the case where you've got intervening luck, you ask a fake fire officer, you don't have understanding on testimony. But you, pro you do in a case where you ask a real fire officer surrounded by a bunch of fakes. What I'm wondering is, what do you think about this case? Here's another twist, twist on the case. So suppose you go there and there's 10 real fire officers, all of them who are going to tell you the truth. So it's not likely at all that you're going to ask someone who gives you a bad explanation. But here's where the luck comes in. Suppose that you're a, you're a lucky grasper, as it were. So suppose that uh, the way you grasp is by a method a good method, but very easily you could have flipped a coin and used some funky method that would have led you with some botched grasping, right? Where, and if you, and if you do the botched grasping, you're not gonna successfully grasp the relationship between the explanands and the explanandum. So what's kind of lucky is what's going on in your head that you happen to use the good method for grasping. Um, and hey, good luck, you do use it. So um, everything's good. So this is kind of like an environmental luck case going on in your head. So I'm wondering what you think about that case. Yeah, good. Thanks. I, I guess I think, okay, so I might change my mind about this, but my first, my first, my, 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 my philosophical spidey senses, as it were, they tell me to say that it's a bit like the case we just had with Bruce, right? It looks like, well, okay, it's like kind of, it's in the background. So it's like, you know, I, I could have left today, I could have left tomorrow, right? But given that I left the day, there's no luck involved, yeah. right? So I think it's kind of like that, you know, once, I, once the method, the method, as it were, is obviously part of the, the basis, yeah. right? Whatever we think that's going to be. So whatever the cho choice of the method seems to be antecedent to the basis. And so that seems like, it's, it's part, so it's kind of like a, it's a, a evidential or circumstantial luck on this view. I'm lucky that I'm in the position that I'm in, but given that I'm in and I use the right method, well, then it's not a matter of luck that my belief is true. So that's kind of my, where, I, where I think I would say about that case. Okay, I think, I, I think I'd go that way too. I was a little bit on the fence, but I think I'm with you on that. Okay, thanks. thanks. All right, just very quickly, and I'll give way to Thomas in a second. Uh, I had a quick follow up about the lucky graspers. So I, this is something I was wondering about myself. So um, 
Uh, suppose you have the priestly Lavoisier correspondence, right? And you have this kind of the, the invention of the concept of oxygen, right? And clearly, on the one hand, there's agency on behalf of Lavoisier, right? He actively builds this concept, right, to account for oxidation. Say, well, what what we'd now call <laughs> oxidation. But on the other hand, there's also a sense that you know things just dawn on him, right? Uh, there is a kind of passivity in, in the, well, I'd like to say in the understanding that he has of combustion, right? And so um, I was wondering if that does anything to your account on which uh, there's a kind of strong cognitive agency requirement for understanding. That's interesting. I don't know enough about the case. In what sense was he passive? I didn't realize he was. That's interesting. Well, I, I, I suppose the case in which we're not always active in which, as it were, we put two and two together. So things just sort of coalesce and it just dawns on us, oh, that must be the right conception. You know, because remember in my view that that, that that would still be compatible with understanding if there's elevated skill involved. And I suspect Lavoisier being Lavoisier, there is elevated skill involved. <laughs> right. It's a right. bit like Holmes, things come easy to Holmes. Um, right. But, but then it would be the kind of uh, elevated skill whereby one is, as it were, put in a position to be in a moment of grace. I mean, it, it, I wouldn't want to say grace because, of course, then you've got right. agency, yeah. external agency. But, yeah. uh, but, I, but I think, you know, remember the circumstantial luck is OK. I mean, just think of a, a more familiar case, Fleming and the, and the, the penicillin, right? I mean, it's lucky that the... The, the microbe flies in through the window and ends on the petri dish. But then, you know, he has to, his active agency is required. I mean, it takes, lots of people could have had that petri dish and not understood anything about penicillin. Fleming does, right? So there's circumstantial luck that is in the conditions he's in to come to know things, but it's not a matter of luck that he does come to know and, it, and it's, it's active agency. So I think you've got strong cognitive achievement. I would imagine the same thing happens with last year. Maybe there's all kinds of circumstantial luck involved. You know, maybe for example, um, you know, maybe there's lots of conditions which are conducive to him understanding, right? Background conditions. But given that he's in those conditions, you know, and he's got these elevated skills and so on, it's now down to him um, that, he, that he understands what he does. And I think that's, I mean, we've got to be careful in the scientific case though, because uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the sort of morals, the sort of history of science is that we tend to tell these stories, the narrative is the individual scientist. Right. One thing we discover time and time again, the individual scientist is part of, the, you know, so, so the, the, I mean, modulo that. But of course, again, that doesn't undermine it. Then you just think, well, there's collaborations rather than individuals. But still, it's the, you know, insofar as the individual does it, then it would be the individual understanding. Well, it just seemed as though, and uh, well, and I'll just shut up with that. But it just seemed as though, uh, in some sense, elevated skill um, put Lavoisier in a good position to take advantage of the luck that was presented to him, right? And yeah, so- Yeah, but that would be okay, that would be okay, you know? That's got to be sort of circumstantial type luck, right? So, you know, it could be that things just go the right way for you and then given your elevated skill, you come to have understanding. Um, and just as, it's the same with knowledge, actually, you know? Some people, the sun shines on them and they get to know things <laughs> a lot easier than other people, but it's no less knowledge as a result, right? All right. Well, thank you so much. And thanks. Uh, thanks to Adam for the initial question. Uh, next up, very quickly, Thomas, if you might possibly, please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, my own is a, a little question. I remember the professor rightly talked about epistemic lock in his instance about the burning house. So I wish to know if there's a distinction between uh, epistemic lock and ignorance, and then if there is or there is not, what's the relationship between epistemic lock, ignorance, and then epistemic responsibility? Okay, thanks. I mean, I, yeah, thanks, that's interesting. I, I, I have a particular view about this. Um, so lots of people think ignorance is just lack of knowledge. And so insofar as epistemic luck undermines knowledge, then you're there by epistemic luck generates ignorance. On my view, though, it's not so straightforward because I, I think there's more to ignorance than just lack of knowledge. I think ignorance is an, an, um, a normative standing. 
So it's lack of, it's basically it's lack of knowledge that you should have had, roughly. So uh, it's not enough just to lack knowledge to be ignorant. Uh, you have to lack knowledge and there has to be some normative standing in place that you've failed to fulfill. Um, so it wouldn't follow on my view that the mere presence of epistemic luck makes you ignorant. It, it might would follow that you don't know, but it wouldn't follow you're ignorant. Whether or not you're ignorant would depend upon, like, for example, do you not know because there's something that you didn't spot that you should have spotted? Or, uh, you know, is it, do you not know because there's something you should have been, uh, some background knowledge you should have had that you didn't have or something like that. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, I have a view about this, but yeah, on standard views, epistemic luck undermines knowledge, therefore it makes you ignorant. It's a straight, straight entailment. All right, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Duncan, and thanks so much, Thomas, for the question. And uh, I'm sure there's so many other questions lurking uh, in the background with, with everyone in, in, in the audience. So uh, if you'd like to ask Duncan any further questions, uh, I think he's kind enough that he's going to have his email inbox open. And so uh, please don't hesitate to shoot him an email. Okay. So, thanks thanks everyone, again. And, thanks for having me. And, and please join me in thanking Duncan. And 